Hare Krishna. I'm very happy to share with you how I came to Krishna consciousness. My name is Devaki Devi Dasi. I am originally from Germany. So when I was living in Germany as a young girl, I always had the dis burning desire to do something for the suffering people in this world. And because we usually identify with the body, I was thinking the best thing to do for suffering people is to help diseased people. So I took a medical profession. I was working in rehabilitation as a physiotherapist in Germany. But then very quickly in due course of my work, I realized I actually cannot really give people what they need to be happy. And I could very clearly say there is some other reason why people are suffering, why they are depressed, why they feel empty in their hearts. So even though I had materially everything, I was, I was living in a nice flat, I earned a lot of money, I had a car, nice friends, everything, simply I was not satisfied. And at some stage I decided, let me give everything up. So I sold everything, I gave everything away. My parents were panicking. They were thinking, what is our daughter doing? She is going crazy. So I gave everything away, I sold everything, I packed a backpack and I started traveling, searching for the medicine which would give real happiness. So I traveled all around Europe, around Africa, around Australia. And then finally in Australia, in Sydney, I met the Iskand devotees. That was in 1985. And I actually came to an ISKCON farm without really knowing anything about Krishna consciousness. I was really searching. I was checking out any organization, anything I could get my hands on, basically. But simply nothing really appealed to me. So and then one one day I was getting so frustrated within my heart, I was really crying out, well, I did not know about Krishna, but ultimately I was crying out to Krishna, what am I going to do with my life? Where am I going to go? So then I had a list of farms in connection with the woofing. Woofing is willing workers on organic farms. It's a an organization where young traveling people can stay on farms and work and get free accommodation and, and food. So I had this list of farming communities which accept woofers. And there was this address, Bhaktivedanta Ashram, on it. And somehow I remember distinctly when I saw this name, something in my heart was telling me, go there, go there. And then I thought, no, why should I go there? Let me have a look where the other farms are. So I had a map, I was looking where all these farms are, but again and again, Super Soul was pushing me, go to this Bhaktivedanta Ashram. So I was ringing and asking, so can I come for a week? I want to work in the garden and I want, I'm a woofer. So the temple president answered the phone and he said, well, what, have you been to one of our restaurants? Have you read our books? And I said, no. And he said, well, maybe you should do this first. And I said, listen, I'm not interested in books and restaurants. I simply want to come out for one week and work on the farm and be there with you. And then he said, okay, okay, you can come. So I came there. And later on, the devotees told me that he announced at breakfast Bushadam, there's this strange German woman coming. She's not interested in our philosophy. She just wants to work in the garden. <laughs> so I came there and I saw, oh no, these are all guys in saffron robes with shaved heads. Oh my God, where am I here, you know? So and I thought, all right, let me go there. Now I lined it all up, I can survive one week, no problem. So that was Kolo River Farm outside Sydney. We don't have that farm today anymore, we had to sell the property. So when I came there, 
There was one devotee, he was a brahmachari at the time. He was the head pujari. He is, his name is Radisham Prabhu. He is, he is now married, he's living in Switzerland. So he is Swiss, and Swiss people, they also speak German. And he had all of Prabhupada's books in German. Not all, but some. So and immediately he started preaching to me. He was the head pujari at the time for Radha Krishna deities. And he immediately engaged me in the pujari room, even though I was wearing my hippie kami clothes. He got me in there in my clothes. He didn't ask me to get changed or nothing. And he engaged me all day polishing the paraphernalia. He even got me to cut up the fruit offering. Yes, even though I was, I actually, I was even smoking at the time still. I had no intention to become a devotee, so I was making my own cigarettes and smoking behind the house there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, we Westerners, we grow up with all these bad habits, you know. So, and he engaged me in service, even to cut up the fruit offering for the Lord. And I loved to do it. I was making a whole artistic, you know, arrangement there on the big tray with all the different fruits, and I decorated them, and oh, I loved doing it, you know, yes. And at the same time, he was preaching to me all day. I had so many questions. I was very, very suspicious. I did not do anything which I did not understand. I didn't even take Chanamrita. I was not circumambulating Tulsi Devi in the mornings, nothing, because I did not know what it was and I couldn't understand it, so I refused to do it. So I had so many questions, and he, he is a very good preacher, so he really answered all my questions perfectly. So, but then after three days, I actually wanted to leave the farm because my visa ran out. My visa for Australia was finished. And I said to him, all right, yeah, it's all very nice. But somehow I think it's not for me and I want to go. I want to go to New Zealand. My visa is finished and so on. And he said to me, what? You can't go now. You promised you would stay for one week. You can't go. You have to stay for one week. He nailed me on that, you know, because I did say, yes, I come for one week. So he really said, you have to stay for one week? And I thought, all right, if you really want me to stay for one week, I can stay for a few days longer, no problem. So and then all the time he asked me, did you read something? Did you read something? He was giving me some books. He was giving me signs of self-realization and Bhagavad Gita. And he was always asking, did you read something? And the first few days I didn't read. But then I thought, all right, let me read. And I started reading Signs of Self-Realization parallel with Bhagavad Gita. First chapter Bhagavad Gita was too many names for me, so I flicked to the second chapter. And immediately, as soon as I started reading, wow, I found so many answers. Second chapter, so many nice verses, you know. Yes, and two days later, I realized, that's it. No need for me to go anywhere else. I had found what I had been looking for, yes. It was a really, it was quite an amazing revelation, really, you know, yes. I realized, that's it. I have to try this. No need to go. So, and, well, I never left the Association of Devotees since then. I simply stayed, I told him in the morning, that one evening I remember I was reading and in the evening I was actually crying and I realized, wow, my, my material life is finished. No more sense enjoyment, no more this, no more that. I, I, that's it. I, I, there was this mixture of extreme joy and happiness, but at the same time a little bit of pain because I realized I had to give up all my material attachments and sense enjoyment and everything. So then the next morning I told Vaida Shampu, um, I think I have to stay, and I, I told him about this experience, you know. And he smiled and he said, Krishna has been dancing before you, he said, yes. So and that's it, from then on, I just immediately, two days later, I chanted 16 rounds, 
no more smoking, no more this, that. And I immediately took up the process wholeheartedly and I just felt such relief. It was amazing. It was really like coming home. After a long journey, finally coming home, you know. Yes. So and from then on, you know, I was four years in the Bhamatrini Ashram in Australia. Then I was married for ten years and we went to former Soviet Union to Latvia and we opened like the first more established temple in the former Soviet Union. Then my husband left Krishna consciousness and then I moved on to the renounced order. So I did not always look like this. I was married, I used to have hair and silk saris and bangles and nose ring and earrings and the whole lot. So and then when my husband left I thought, all right, that's it. No more man woman business. Let me just move on and so now since 1999 I'm living the life of a traveling preacher and I mainly preach six months in, in the Indian part of the world, so to speak, and six months in Europe. When I'm in this part of the world, I'm mainly in Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh is actually my home. I think somehow by mistake I took birth in Germany, but actually my heart is a Bangladeshi one and the external body is made in Germany. <laughs> so I spent about three, four months in Bangladesh, two months in Mayapur. I do some preaching there, some courses about spiritual culture, exploring the roots of spiritual culture. I give holy name retreats in Echo Chakra and so many other places. And Nepal I'm also visiting. And <clears throat> in Europe, I'm mainly in Ukraine. Yeah, three months in Ukraine, and a little bit in Sweden, Germany, a little bit in the Baltic sometimes. But my main focus is <coughs> Ukraine and Bangladesh. I think they are the, the most dynamic preaching fields. They have one thing in common. Life is very simple. People are poor, but they are so turning towards Krishna consciousness. Maybe you heard Ukraine, we have the big Bhakti Sangam festival every year. This year we had 10,000 devotees there. Yes. So I'm there every year for the last 14 years and I give a seminar there and so on. Yeah, amazing. It's the most amazing festival in the universe, this Bhakti Sangam in Ukraine. Yeah, and I made a humble attempt. I introduced Bhakti Sangam festival in Bangladesh, in Nepal, and in Scandinavia also. But one thing I have to quickly tell also in regards to me joining Krishna Consciousness. When I was about 14, which was in 1972, 72, 73, I actually got a book. I got a Bhagavad Gita in Germany on the street. And this was quite an amazing experience. I was a young girl. I was just on the way home from school. and. I was walking up the, the mall, you know, a street where there is no traffic, just shops and pedestrians going. So I was walking up the mall and I saw a Harinam party there. So that was 72, you know. I saw a Harinam party there, some Brahmacharis chanting, dancing. I was walking up the street, I was thinking, what the hell is going on there? And when I just got there, it stopped. And I thought, oh, what a shame, I missed that. What was here? I was all excited. Then one Brahmin Chai came up to me and he gave me a Bhagavad Gita, a soft copy Bhagavad Gita in the hand, and he said, here, this is for you. I said, okay, thank you very much. And then he asked me for donation, but I, did, I was a schoolgirl, I didn't have any money, I just had enough money for the bus. So I said to him, I'm sorry, I don't have any money. And he said, okay, you can keep it. And he gave me, I mean, this is a little bit against the rules of book distribution, but that's why I want to share it. He gave me a Bhagavad Gita for free. He said, okay, you can keep it. So now I remember exactly, I was sitting in the bus and I was looking at this Bhagavad Gita. And I was wondering, what the hell are they doing? Why are they giving books away in the street for free? I couldn't work it out, you know? And I was looking at the pictures 
Yes, and, and I remember exactly something really was happening in the heart there, you know, and I was thinking, wow, I, what is this? These pictures are so unique and special, you know. I was just sitting in the bus looking at the pictures, reading a few captions of the pictures there. And then when I came home, I gave the book to my mother. I said, look what I got in the street. There were some people who gave books away for free in the street. And she had a look at it and I said, why are they doing this? And she said, I don't know, they just want to propagate something. So, and the book ended up in the bookshelf and nobody ever read it. But it was there all those years. So that was 72, 73, I can't exactly remember the year, but something around that. So then 85, I met the devotees in Australia and immediately I realized they are the same guys who gave me this book in the street for free. I was amazed. So I immediately wrote a letter to my mother and I said, do you still have this book? You know? And she said, actually my parents are divorced, my mother married again. So her second ha husband had just cleaned up the bookshelf a week before I joined. And he came across this Bhagavad Gita and he decided, what is this? We don't need this anymore. So he, I don't know exactly what he did with it, maybe he threw it away, maybe he put it in, the, in a box and gave it to a second-hand bookshop or something, I don't know exactly what happened, I wasn't there at the time. But he got rid of it. So my mother told me, well, sorry, you know, Klaus, her second husband, he just cleaned up the bookshelf and the book is not there anymore. And first I was disappointed. I would have loved to have that copy of the Bhagavad Gita, of course. But then I smiled to myself. I thought, no, the Bhagavad Gita simply moved on. It had fulfilled its purpose. I became a devotee. I met the devotees. That's how long the book was staying in our house. And then, <laughs> because it was really a week before I joined, something like this. And just when I met the devotees, Bhagavad Gita had moved on, you know, so in that way the books really have their own life, you know, yeah, yeah, it moved on. So, and another thing, I went twice to Australia actually, the year before I met the devotees there, I was also very close to meeting the devotees, but I was just not quite ready, you know. I remember I was in Sydney and there was the temple in King's Cross, and they had a food for life distribution in the back and the takeaway restaurant in the front. And I was staying in the youth hostel and amongst the travelers, there was the news going around, you can get some free food there, you know, at the food for life. All the travelers knew they were going there just to save money. They're always on the tight budget, you know, traveling around the world. So, and I, I was thinking, free food, I want to go there. But somehow I couldn't find the back entrance, you know, because it was some little lane there in the back, and I couldn't find it. All I could find was the front, the takeaway where you had to pay. So I was there with a few traveling friends I had met while traveling around Australia. We were looking, 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 we couldn't find it. So I said, all right, let me just go in the front. I want to get something to eat. So, and the restaurant was just behind the temple room and it was Guarati time. And while I was there picking what I wanted to take as a takeaway, I could hear the kirtan. And I was thinking, what, what the hell is going on here? And one devotee came out, just giving something in the restaurant, and I saw him and I thought, God, he looks interesting. What's he doing, you know? What's he all about? Shaved head, and he looked so happy. And I was, I was saying to my friends, let, let me talk to these people. Who are they? What are they doing? And they were dragging me along. No, no, come on, we have to go. We want to go to the movies. Come on, come on, come on. You know, so I was really pulled to Krishna there, finding out, oh, what, what are they doing here, you know? What is all this music there? But my friends were dragging me along. No, 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 it's all right, they're good guys. Let's come on, let's go, let's take the food, and we want to go and enjoy, you know? So I was 
dragged along there with them, thinking, oh, what are they doing, the devotees there, you know. But time was just not quite ready yet, you know, so like that. So, and then, but then the year later, I met the devotees and time was right. So it shows, you know, how every little contact with the devotees builds up, builds up, builds up until the time is right, you know. And one last thing I have to share, when I was 10 years old in 68, 69, I traveled for one whole year with my parents around Africa. Yes, my parents are quite unusual people. I grew up traveling. So for a whole year I didn't go to school. We traveled around the southern part of Africa, a whole big adventure. But one thing in Africa, the black people, they have a certain singing and dancing style which is very similar to Kirtan. Yeah, one person leads and the other persons follow and they play drums and they dance. And I was a small kid, I was 10 years old, and I was really fascinated by them. And in the evenings I used to sneak off and watch them, how they were singing and dancing and playing drums. And this made a really deep impression in my heart. And since then, from that time on, when we came back to Germany in 69, I knew Germany is not my place. I don't want to stay here. And I was always looking for the country where people sing and dance and play drums. <laughs> yes, yes, I was really searching for this. And then finally, 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 so many years later, I found it in Bangladesh, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so all these little things were quite significant in order to finally bring me to Krishna consciousness. Okay, thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.